Welcome back to Podcast Listeners. This is Dr. Raywat Dionandan, Global Health Epidemiologist at the University of Ottawa. Today's episode is the audio of a video interview that I did of Dr. Anders Tegnell, who famously runs the Swedish COVID-19 response. This interview was done in partnership with Dr. Ziad Khatib, who made this all possible. He runs the Facebook Epidemiologist Group. And some of the questions were submitted by members of that group. If you don't know, Dr. Tegnell is a fairly controversial figure, given his um, his unorthodox approach to combating the epidemic in Sweden. Um, our questions were uh, mostly epidemiological, but I still think you will find it interesting. Um, so, hello everyone. My name is Ziad Khatib, and I'm an associate professor in global health at the Karolinska Institute. But today I'm in my capacity here as the uh, founder of the Facebook group uh, Epidemiologists. Um, I would like to welcome Dr. Anders Tegnell. Dr. Tegnell is a medical doctor with a PhD in infectious diseases and a master in epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene and Epidemiology. He has worked with preparedness for health threats in different settings since the early 2000s. Dr. Tegnell has been the state epidemiologist of Sweden since 2013. He has been working closely together with many others in developing uh, the pandemic plans in Sweden. He has been involved and managed health threats starting with the Ebola outbreak in the Zaire DRC in 1995. And also we have on the session as well, uh, Dr. Rewa Dionandan, who holds a PhD in epidemiology. He is an associate professor and an assistant director of the Interdisciplinary School of Health Sciences at the University of Ottawa. He is a former chief scientist with the Canadian government and former board member of the Canadian Society of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. So for this meeting today, it will be for a duration of uh, 30 minutes where it, will, it is of a style of questions and answers. Uh, Ray has prepared a set of questions and there might be questions of clarifications for follow-up on the questions. Otherwise, it would be a straightforward Q&A session. Uh, for myself, I have two questions that I will start with them and then I will give the floor to Ray. I should note that these questions were collected through posting online and asking our network if they have the chance to ask Dr. Anders Tegnell one question, what it would be. So I will start. Um, my first question, what are the most innovative or effective ways uh, they have, that they ha they have, you have seen to engage communities in the decision-making process for reducing the transmission of the COVID-19 and overall issues overcoming COVID-19 problems beyond transmission? Well, that's a big question. Um, I think there's, you can answer it in many different ways. I think one of the innovative things that we have seen during this pandemic when it comes to epidemiology is that we, uh, to a much greater extent than before, started using uh, different sources of data. Uh, so now we get data from uh, the local traffic providers, uh, we get data from the store owners, uh, we get data from uh, transport companies, etc., uh, etc. Et and thereby we can follow as indicators to how much our population actually changed their behaviors. Uh, mobile phone data, for example, we can use to see how many people actually work from home. Uh, in Sweden right now, 40-50% of the workforce is working from home. And we can see how that has been changing over time. And I think that's very useful when it comes to understanding when you need to reinforce your communication in, in certain areas <clears throat> to once again remind people about what's important to do. I think that's, I mean, many things has happened during this pandemic, but I think that's one of the 
more interesting things <laughs> when it comes to epidemiology, that there's actually different sources of data uh, which you can use to, to track how people actually change behavior, because that's something that's very, very difficult to, to, I mean, you can ask people and they will answer. And to a certain extent, it's true and certain extent is how they feel about things. But to get more objective data about how people actually change behavior, I think that's, uh, for me, been very interesting to see how we can do that. Okay, thank you. My second question, when it comes to the science of prevention, versus science of treating COVID-19. Why it does seem that the science of prevention tend to be a little bit inconsistent in between countries? Probably because it's so much more difficult to measure effects of prevention than to measure effects of treatment. I mean, when treatment, you have a patient in a hospital, it's quite easy to collect a fair amount of different people <laughs> with different treatment protocols. You have good control on how the treatment protocol actually, what kind of effect they give. When it comes to prevention, it's much more difficult to actually follow uh, the effect of measures, not least because you tend to institute a lot of measures at the same time, and then to understand what part of a lockdown was really the important one. Was it closing the restaurant, closing the gyms, closing the uh, communal transport or what was the most important part of it. Uh, so I think that's why there is a continuous dispute around what are the uh, preventive measures that actually have an effect. Okay. Now I uh, will hand over the floor to Ray and I will keep track of the time as well to, to, to keep it for the 30 minutes. So Ray, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ziad, and thank you so much for your time this morning. Well, for me, it's morning, Dr. Tegna. So the, I don't think it's uh, untoward to say that the Swedish COVID-19 experience has been highly politicized around the world, mostly by people who don't have a firsthand knowledge of what's happening in Sweden. So is there a sentiment or reality about the Swedish COVID-19 experience that you would like clarified, that you want the world to understand more accurately? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. One of them is that the response in Sweden has not been politicized uh, very much. Recently, a bit more, because the opposition in Sweden has raised uh, questions around how it's been handling. But for a long time, not at all. It was much more a technical discussion than a political discussion. I think that's quite different to, to many other countries where, where it became political very early on. Uh, so in Sweden, it became, it remained uh, very technical at, at least, I would say, for the first six, seven months. And even now, it's still mainly technical, not very political. I think that's one thing. The other thing is that the response is not that very different to, to the response in many other countries. I mean, we have also worked very hard with trying to keep people from meeting each other as much as possible. Um, we have used different methods to a certain extent by not closing down the whole society, instead closing down certain areas of the society, like big gatherings, restaurants to a great extent, and, and things. So we focus it more on places where we know that there is a big risk of transmission. And then we have leaned a lot on uh, voluntary measures from the population, like working from home when you can. And as I said before, for at least 40% of the Swedish workforce is actually working from home now. Uh, it's of course, depending on that, the Swedish sort of, the, the kind of work that we have to a great extent in Sweden is possible to do that, uh, but also a willingness both from employers and from employees to actually follow this kind of advice and to do that to a very great extent. So the end result when it comes to social distancing and so on, if that could be measured in an accurate way, I wouldn't say it would be all that great different between the, the sort of formal legal lockdown in, in, a, in another country compared to the kind of virtual lockdown we have in Sweden. So following up on that question, I think you almost answered this, is how would you characterize the current status of the epidemic in Sweden as compared to your neighbors and the rest of Europe? I would say that we are in a critical phase like many countries in Europe right now. Uh, we had... Uh, the Swedish second wave peaked just before Christmas. And since then, it's been going down quite a lot. Uh, we have a lot less cases and the healthcare services all have a lot less pressure. Now, since the last two or three weeks, we see a slight increase again, not dramatic so far, but uh, around five, 10% increase in cases every uh, 
every week and we see also slight increase in, in the number of hospitalized people. And I think that's what I would say many countries in Europe see right now, that we, we have a feeling that we might be getting into something that we call the third wave. And I think now everybody's fighting to try to keep that as low as possible and that we can vaccinate as many as possible to, to try to minimize the effect of a, of a third wave. We can already see, I think, a great effect on mortality in Sweden. Uh, even if the number of hospitalized cases are going up, the mortality is still sinking. Uh, and I think that's due to that we by now have vaccinated more than 80% of the inhabitants in our uh, long-term care facilities, where at least 50% of the mortality took place. Uh, and that seems to have had a great effect. So it's due to a combination of vaccination and to measures to harden and protect long-term care centers? Yes. Uh, a lot of measures have sort of been put in place. The, the, the staff has been trained a lot. Uh, um, there has been, to a certain extent, a ban on visits and a number of other measures have been taking place in the long-term care facilities. And that, in combination with the vaccine now, seems to really uh, saving people there to a great extent. When I look around the world at the countries that I think have done well with COVID, I see three common characteristics. Number one is they acted early and they acted hard. Number two, they got very good at case detection through testing and tracing. And number three, they patrolled their borders for reinfection and limited and minimized incoming infection. Do you agree with that assessment? And if not, how would you list the, the, the best practices for COVID management around the world? I mean, of course you're right. I mean, there are countries like New Zealand, Iceland, uh, and a few others where that uh, is very pertinent. But there is also examples of countries having done the same things and it didn't work. Uh, so I think it's a, a bit more complicated. And uh, Italy, for example, in, in also closed down, they closed their borders very early on. And, and uh, But in spite of that, had a very early, very uh, difficult pandemic and still has a very difficult pandemic. So these measures seems to work in a certain context, but not always. And when I have this discussion with my colleagues in different European countries, we, we seem to end up saying that the first sort of influx of cases made a lot of difference. The countries who had a huge first influx, like Sweden, uh, like the Netherlands, like UK and so on, with many, many cases coming uh, from because of travel and so on, uh, coming from different parts of the world being affected. And that huge sort of first seeding uh, seems to be very, very difficult to handle. And, uh, and actually, I mean, uh, Swedish, it was not that we ignored the thing from the beginning, not at all. Uh, we did a lot of things very early on. Uh, and we managed to catch most of the people coming from places where we knew there was an ongoing uh, epidemic, like Italy, the Italian Alps and so on. And we can see afterwards that those variants of viruses never took hold in Sweden. But there was so much transmission going on in other parts of the world that uh, people coming back from there um, took in a, a large amount of cases in Sweden at the same time. And that meant that the health system couldn't really cope. We couldn't keep up with the contact tracing and so on. And we needed to go back to mitigation and and, and instead focus on, on taking care of the sick people because there was just not resources to do both things at the same time. You need to realize that out of 10 million people in Sweden, 1 million people travel abroad uh, to, to foreign countries within two or three weeks uh, during these winter holidays. And, and that that in combination with that, that the places that travel to in Europe had probably a fairly high level of uh, transmission of COVID-19 already. At that. And my Dutch colleagues says the same thing and during the carnival in the Netherlands they had a huge influx of cases and and then it seems to be very difficult to get back on that because once you have a great seating of it and have a lot of cases in your country it's very very difficult to to ever get it very low again uh, and that has shown because many of the worst hit countries during the first wave also were very hard hit during the second wave like the UK like the Netherlands like Sweden while countries who had a fairly mild first round, like Norway and Finland, uh, also during the second wave, uh, got much easier off. But it's difficult, and I think it's a lot more due to context than actual measures uh, to, to a great extent. So would you add to my list of best practices? Are there any other strategies you think should be adopted around the world or, uh, or raised to the position of best practices? 
I think contact tracing and wide testing and so on, I think is probably the main one. Uh, closing borders is a tricky one because it's possible for some countries, but for others, it's, it's just not possible uh, because at least in Europe, we live with open borders and, and having them closed have so great consequences that it can only be handled for a very, very short time. Uh, so contact tracing, I think is uh, contact tracing testing and having a lot of resources to do that uh, and focusing on, on these areas where you see a lot of spread. Uh, these super spreading events or super spreading sites, I think uh, to, to handle those like they did in Japan for a long time. Yeah. I think that's- Dispersion, uh, yeah. So one of the aspects of the COVID-19 response that really differs from the way we've done things in North America is in how we use non-pharmaceutical interventions like masks. So we rely upon them heavily in Sweden, not so much. So I guess my question is, how can you explain or can you explain that there can be such different interpretations of the effectiveness data on how to use NPIs like masks? I mean, because this, the, the data is so scant. Uh, I think one of the lessons from this is that we need to be much better at evaluating uh, these kind of non-pharmaceutical measures uh, during pandemics at an early stage. Uh, I mean, there are observational studies when it comes to face masks, there's a Danish study, didn't really show any difference. Of course, that can be criticized. There is other studies from the US comparing different countries, different uh, provinces in the US, showing that there might be a correlation between face masks and, and how the spread is, is moving. Uh, but there is also other studies showing the other way around. Uh, it is difficult to, to, uh, to, to actually evaluate the effect of, of these kind of measures for sure. But I think we could, as an international community, done a lot better on that. Uh, thought about a bit more control studies, uh, having different kind of measures in different places and try to follow them up better than we did. Uh, now we, we are reacted because we were in a crisis and, and nobody really thought very much about the follow-up of the effects very well. Mm. And, and I think at least to, to a certain extent, that's where we ended up interpreting data in different ways. But also because the effect is probably different in different contexts. I mean, in Sweden, uh, it's reasonably easy uh, to keep distances. Uh, we can work from home a lot. We don't need to travel to work, uh, many of us. Uh, and that makes, of course, the, uh, the extra effect of masks much, much smaller in Sweden than, than in a crowded place like New York, for example. Interesting. My next question is, is kind of personal. I hope you don't mind. Uh, public health experts, epidemiologists, infectious disease doctors around the world have been under a lot of criticism as a result of this pandemic. There have been attacks by all sides of the political spectrum. Has this been personally difficult for you this past year? And if so, can you suggest any strategies for other epidemiologists and how to deal with this politicization and personalization of the pandemic? Yeah, I can't deny that it's at certain time been difficult. I mean, I've received threats different levels, the police has been involved. And, and of course, uh, even my family has been threatened at time. Uh, and, and that's of course not something I take lightly. Uh, on the other hand, since we have such a big uh, part of the population behind us, uh, we know that 80, 90% of the population say they follow our advice. Uh, the approval rating of the public agency has fallen slightly, but it's been up to 75, 80%. Now it's 60, 65 something. So, and also working in a big agency with a lot of support from my, from my colleagues, of course. Uh, so having that sort of behind you uh, and realizing that these people uh, shouting a lot is actually a very, very small group of people. Uh, and most of the time, not, not the people that really understand the situation very well. I mean, there are exceptions, of course. I wouldn't say that everybody's wrong, but uh, many of them uh, have not really. Yeah, delve deeply into the problem we are facing and how complex they are. So I think that that's what gives you assurance in this kind of situation that you, and I think that's Thank the you. important part. You need to have colleagues to talk with. Uh, you need to have people to talk with that you can talk with in an in, in intelligent manner. They might not always agree with you. And I think that's not, at least that's not the point for me. I, I, I really like talking to people who don't agree to, with me because that's how I understand better and can really find my good arguments or decide that something else needs to be done. Uh, so I think that's really the key. You need to have good people around you.
it's a good segue for my next question because you you have heightened or highlighted the, the quality of community. And so throughout this pandemic, I think there's been a tension between understanding individual rights versus community rights or individual mm. way of thinking versus a public health population way of thinking. Are there guidelines, are there rules for managing the tension between individual rights and population needs? How do we find a middle ground between the two? I think that's a very good question because how do you translate a risk on a population level to a risk for the individual? And I think yeah. that's something it, can, it boils down to. How do you communicate with the individual on what for the individual might be a very small risk, but for the population might be a big risk? And, and then convince the individual how important it is to, to be considerate to the population. Uh, and I think, I think that's where the tradition in different countries is different. Um, and I think in Sweden, there is, a, it's changing over time. I mean, Sweden is becoming more and more like other countries, but, but there is sort of a long tradition to be fairly much uh, considerate to the population needs, uh, to others' needs. Uh, and maybe it's slightly easier in Sweden to convince people to go and vaccinate them uh, because not because to protect themselves, but to protect uh, the elderly and the population. So uh, it might be slightly easier in Sweden than in many other countries. So, so I think our starting position in Sweden when it comes to those kind of things is slightly easier than in many other countries. Interesting. I want to make sure I get this question in. Uh, I'm cognizant of time uh, because I know we have uh, young epidemiologists watching this conversation. And, and I'm wondering if you could give them any advice on how, how to invest in their careers early on. They're watching this pandemic unfold. They're seeing struggles of people like yourself who are prominent on the world stage and how public the work is becoming. And that's a little scary for some of mm. them, I think. So is there any advice you could give to young epidemiologists who are starting their careers right now? And not to be scared because it's a really fascinating world they are getting into. And there's so many, I think the the, what I find really interesting now that there's so many new sets of data uh, that we haven't really thought about in our digital world uh, that can be both overestimated and underestimated, but we need to understand them much better because they would, I think, give us a great source of epidemiology in the future, which is not so much dependent on reports from the healthcare and, and other things uh, which are much more difficult to get and not so much dependent on people answering surveys and so on, which they, at least in Sweden, stopped doing to a certain extent. So I think that's a fascinating thing. And, and try to start out widely, uh, not get too focused on, on one disease or one aspect to, to realize that epidemi the fascinating thing about epidemiology is that it can be applied to so many different situations. So, to, and wonderful answer, by the way, to, to bring it back to the topic of the pandemic, what do you think are the indicators for success of managing this pandemic at the population level? Uh, that's... A real tricky one. I mean, the, the easy answer is how what how the, how has it affected your public health in your population in the end, on the whole. Okay. Uh, what timeline though? Like a short term, long term? Pro probably probably long term. I mean, we know that certain things is going to take long term. We know that people with with cancers most likely end up being uh, diagnosed and treated later. Uh, during this pandemic than uh, there were in the future uh, or in the past. Uh, we know that people with heart conditions didn't turn up in the emergency ward to the extent that they used to. And those kind of things would, of course, take a long time before they really are shown in, in our public health measures. We know that mental health among certain parts of the population has deteriorated for sure. Uh, we also know that there is some long-term consequences of COVID-19 disease as it as it is. So there's many different aspects uh, that you need to follow, I think, before you can really say, did we get through this pandemic in a reasonable way or not? Uh, and of course, the easy way is to look at mortality or number of cases, but, but it's, I think in the end, it would turn out much more complex than that. Can you suggest some indicators, uh, hospitalization usage, measurements of happiness and resilience, for example, morbidity? Yeah, I mean, I think we, as most countries in the world, we, we do follow a number of indicators of, of public health in, in the population. Uh, among this, I mean, the level of chronic diseases, uh, um, excess mortality among young people and so on. I think we need to go back to that and see how, how did those indicators that we used to follow, how did that change uh, during the pandemic? So looking back over the past uh, 10, 11 months, 
Is there anything you would have done differently in terms of the pandemic response in Sweden? I mean, hindsight is a difficult thing because, of course, uh, when you know more things, you, you might have done them differently. Uh, but at the same time, I think most of us working with the pandemic has really tried to do take the best decision we can at the given time, given the information we have and, and the context we are living in. Uh, of course, in Sweden, we would have very much liked it to have a more resilient long-term care facilities to start with. Uh, we knew we had problems. Uh, but we didn't know to what extent those problems really would affect uh, the people living there during a pandemic. Uh, I think nobody could dream about uh, the, the death toll we would have in those institutions. And of course, we would have liked uh, to understand that earlier on and, and to take more measures in those places, uh, being more insistent on, on measures there. Uh, our healthcare system, especially when it came to testing, uh, was inadequate. And... Uh, we should probably have done more early on to, to get more testing into place. We should have more moved more people into contact tracing early on than we did, uh, because that probably would have made a difference. But uh, yeah, this is all in hindsight. It's it's difficult. Well, hindsight is useful for the next question, which is looking forward to the next pandemic. What have we learned that we can apply to the next infectious disease uh, emergency? What lessons can we derive from this emergency, for, not just for Sweden, but for the world? I think first and foremost, to be, to be flexible. Uh, we need to understand that the next pandemic most likely will need different measures than this one did. Uh, because quite often we, we tend to work with, with our next emergency the way we worked with the previous one. And that's usually not very effective because they're all different so I think that's and the other thing which I really missed is a better international collaboration mm -hmm. I think we could have been much better at what we talked about a bit earlier at evaluating uh, the effect of different measures uh, really collaborating around that in a much more efficient manner than we did this time to follow up on the on the first few thousand cases in the world to really understand uh, what are the, the places where people get infected most uh, how do we treat them the best and so on. I think also looking at what did we actually do when we start closing borders all, all, all over the world? Uh, was that a reasonable thing to do or was it not? Uh, trying to collate data on the, on the effects of things. In, in, I know we've been talking about this before. Uh, I mean, from the swine flu pandemic, the evaluation of that, we say the same thing. We say the same thing after the West Africa <coughs> Ebola outbreak and uh, I think somebody said very wisely during one of the meetings after the last Ebola outbreak that uh, this is exactly the same discussion we had during the last uh, follow-up of the last crisis. Uh, and somehow I hope that maybe next time we can say, okay, at least we had a different kind of discussion this time than we had after the last one. <laughs> I Do I have time for note? The... Yes, we oh, have yeah. one minute left. So... Oh. I, yeah. I, I'm hoping you could answer, just comment quickly on the value of communication, on the quality of public health communication and how we can make it better. It's incredibly important, I think. Uh, and I think you need to stress that it's communication. Uh, you need to have a, a way of understanding what the community wants to hear about. Uh, so I think different ways of communi actually communicating with your public is very, very important. Not just informing them about things, but actually communicating with them. I think that's one of the key things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Again, I know that your time is limited, Dr. Tegnell, so I would like to thank you and also Dr. Deodanden on the behalf of the Facebook group Epidemiologists. Thank you so much and stay safe and well. All the best. Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. Bye -bye.